Uh, welcome to the next lecture on real-time systems and what you've been looking at is another electromechanical electromagnetic device known as a stepper motor a stepper motor quite important because if you go into this business you'll be using them let me just briefly explain what they are we've discussed electromagnetic devices let's look at another idea Instead of just having one magnet, let's have four magnets. Now we know that when we energize any of these coils, they look like an ordinary magnet. So what would happen if we were to put in the middle of this arrangement with a spindle think of this as the axis into the board a permanent magnet north and south a permanent bar magnet what would happen when we energize that particular coil so we put magnetism through there so that that then becomes a south pole and that's a north pole these three are off what would this magnet want to do well light poles are uh, at repel um, unlike poles attract so what would happen is that that would suddenly spin round so that it positioned itself in a new position so that its north was opposite that south pole and its south was opposite that north pole so what we have a means here is a mechanism by switching on this particular coil we can line up the central bar magnet into that position. Now let's switch this off and instead we'll switch that one on. What's going to happen? Well as soon as this field disappears and that field comes on the polar magnet spun around again to that position and then we could do that with coil 3 and coil 4 so that we can continually by pulsing out a series of pulses one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We will spin the central bar, the shaft, around the four magnets. And that is exactly what we've seen happening with our stepper motor. Here we have the wires to the magnets here. And as each coil is pulsed, so the shaft starts rotating. Now, why are we interested in devices such as these? Well, the reason is, is that the control of a series of digital output binary numbers, it's perfect for computing. So rather than use the traditional DC motor, what's a DC motor? Let's look at one. Here we have a very straightforward, simple child's toy. DC motor, it runs off a pair of batteries. You've seen this thing before, it's the sort of thing you get in uh, uh, toy trains or toy cars, or very, very large ones are used in factories. And then we just have a simple battery, we stick it on the battery, and it rotates a traditional DC motor. But the problem with a DC motor is that it requires a battery voltage. And to vary the speed, you have to vary the voltage that's coming out of the battery. So in order to control the DC motor, our computer has to output a variable signal, a variable voltage, high speed, high volt, low speed, low volt. Computers aren't good at that. Ones and noughts, they understand. So if we can have instead a motor system that understands ones and noughts such as this, then we have the ability to drive a motor directly from a computer digital output. And that's exactly what a stepper motor is. We have a permanent magnet. And by energizing each of these in turn, we will drive the permanent magnet round Normally there is a gearing system that goes off to a much wider wheel and there we have the main shaft of our motor that we have seen in our 
demonstration. So here's the main shaft on a gearing system, and inside here will be the four coils. Here's the four coils. Now, how do we work this? Well, you take these signals back to the computer, four digital output signals, that's all we need to drive our stepper motor. How do we do it? Well, here we have our four outputs, one, two, three, and four. Four digital outputs, and all we have to do is to scan the binary pattern 1000010000100100000001, and then round again, energizing each cord in turn, and that way our step motor will spin. That's very simple, isn't it? How do we change the speed of rotation? Well, the faster our program runs around the loop, the quicker the motor will turn. So you can actually control very precisely the absolute rotational speed of a drill or any machine tool by using a stepper motor rather than the traditional power operated DC motor. These things, stepper motors, are far easier to control with a computer than ordinary motors. And it's just a binary pattern. There's other tricks here. There's some very nice things about this. When you spin a motor, let's get a shaft. Let's pretend this is our motor shaft and it's spinning away. Let's assume it's a drill, so it's drilling in. How far have we gone? Well, with the stepper motor, we inherently know how far we've gone. But once it starts stepping, our computer program is outputting these steps. And we know that every time we output a pulse, every time we pulse, step, 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 we know we've turned a part of the circle. In fact, we inherently know exactly where the motor is all the time because we know how many pulses we've output to the drive. Every, dri every uh, uh, pulse twists us to the next magnet and it's a known precise position. So inherently, we always know where our motor position is. You can't do that with this thing. You've no idea where it is. Because all you do is you output a voltage and it spins. But we don't know. You could time it, but you don't know precisely where it's gone to. You could estimate it. If it was sort of held up a little bit or slowed down or speed sped up, it could be anywhere. You have no absolute knowledge of the position of a DC motor. So again, from a computer control point of view, a stepper motor, we know where we are inherently. One of these we don't. Now, if we need to know our position on a DC motor, what can we do? Well, in earlier lectures, we discussed the use of quadrature encoding. And here we have the role of quadrature encoding by putting these light and dark bands on the shaft. We would feed back, I use the word again, feed back into our computer the pulses from the shaft encoder, the quadrature encoded signals here on the shaft, and that would tell us where we are. So with a DC motor, a DC motor, it will turn the shaft, but we need to have a shaft encoder, this quadrature encoding concept, to feed back two signals to our computer so we know exactly where we are. Otherwise, there's no way we could do position, velocity, or acceleration control. The stepper motor, however, inherently, we always know where we are precisely because our program outputs the steps. So we know how far we've shifted it without any need for any form of feedback. We have absolute control of velocity, position, and acceleration by the rate we drive it. Now let's look at some other ways we could drive it. If you wanted a bit more power, you don't actually have to use a single coil. You can double it up. Why not do 1100? 
1001, and so on. It will still be the same number of steps, so the precision's the same, but you've doubled the power because you're energizing two magnets each time. Four steps to get you around. You can combine the two if you want to find a position. This is known as a full step operation. But what you could do is you could implement a mixture of the first pattern I showed you with the second. By combining the single coil energy system, one coil on, one and two, then two, two and three, then three, three and four, then four, four and five, what you actually do is you get eight steps out of your system instead of four, and this is known as half step operation. Doesn't give you any more power, but it gives you finer precision. Both of these modes of operation are known as unipolar. The reason they're unipolar is you only ever drive the magnet in one direction only. And that is very easy to implement and to interface to a computer. In fact, I'll show you the drive card. Here is the complete, I'll turn it over, you can't see it there, the complete computer circuit to drive this uh, motor. There is the microprocessor, that's its power supply, and these are the four transistor drivers for each of the four coils. So it's an extremely small compact solution to give us motion control. with a range of very, very low cost devices. Nice tiny little card. You can actually embed it in your system, literally just behind the motor itself. They can go in the same package together and you have a computer. This is, this is the computer and the driver together with the motor in a very small compact package and you have a motor drive system under program control. Very, very simple to do. That's unipolar. The alternative mechanism is the bipolar technique that is far more complex because what you do is you reverse the magnetism through the coils. I'm not going to go into that because I think that's beyond the scope of this module. And what it does is it gives you an almost factor of four increase in the torque you can get out of the stepper motor. But it does require more complex electronics. I want you to know it exists, but we don't need to know in detail how to do it. So here we have stepper motor drive. Half step, half step, and full step mechanism that spins the motor around. So let's now contrast our two types of motor. We've discussed the stepper motor. Very easy to control from a computer. A series of pulses and steps. And we've contrasted it with a DC motor. Let's get them both going. Make things a bit exciting. And away we go. Now, why is it that we would prefer to use the stepper motor? The reason we use the stepper motor is that it's very easy for us to control it with a computer. We know where we are, we know our speed, we know our velocity. So why don't we use them all the time? Well, there's a very good reason. See how easy it is for me to stall it? I can just put my finger on and it stopped moving. With the DC motor, similar amount of power, I just cannot stop that motor going. No matter how much I try and jam it and stop it, it's just that inherently, because of the mechanics there, the power or rather the torque you get out of a stepper motor 
is about an order of magnitude less than the same you'll get for the same size motor and as a DC motor. So here we have the contrast. We programmers, we like stepper motors. Why? We know where they are. They don't require any feedback. They don't require a shaft encoder. We can control the velocity and the acceleration by changing the rate we pulse out our drive pulses. We know where we are all the time. We can drive robots to their exact position just by counting pulses. But with the DC motor, we've no idea where we are. It just spins and spins and spins and we just lose our position. We don't know where we are. We have to use instead the shaft encoder concept to keep track of where we are. This means that our computer program, as well as driving out the analog voltage, and driving out analog voltages isn't easy anyway, because it's a computer only like binary numbers. We've also got to monitor the shaft encoder uh, signals coming back. We need to have some sort of feedback to know where we are. The reason that you might be forced to use a DC motor is because of the power. Now there's always an argument, you, you'll sit down at the beginning of a project with a mechanical designer, they will want the most amount of power they can in the smallest amount of space. The mechanical people, they will want a DC motor. You, the programmer, you will want the stepper motor. You've just got to argue it out. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You don't get anything for nothing, unfortunately. They're very easy to program, but they're not that powerful, whereas the DC motor is a far more superior unit to use. So let's summarise this. Two types of motor. I want you to understand them and know the difference. Stepper motor uses electromagnets. We send out pulses. We know precisely where we are. We can control the velocity, the acceleration, by changing the rate that we pulse things out. The DC motor uses an analog voltage. We have to output a variable voltage signal to, to control the speed of the motor. And we have to have digital feedback from a shaft encoder to tell us where we are, these quadrature pulses to tell us whether we're going forward or back. So the program is far more complex. However, the DC motor gives us substantially more power than the AC motor. Welcome to the next part of the Real-Time Systems module. What we're going to discuss today is the end of interfacing, that is how computers access the outside world. Now, at the back of the notes, you will find a, uh, a picture that gives you the outline design of the PIC processor. Extremely important device, it's one of the world's most popular uh, computers, it sells by the million. And the interesting thing about it is if you look at any particular device, here's one of the simpler devices. Now what have we got here on this device? This is what the chip looks like. It's a 20 pin chip. There's a few power supply pins, but the bulk of the pins you, you might note are labelled RA, RB. These are pure digital input and output devices. Each of these RA and RB pins on the device are directly connected to memory locations in the processor's map, which means that when we read or write to that memory location, in fact, we're reading and writing directly to these particular pins. And this is the standard structure for all microcontrollers. Now let's 
draw a schematic of a microcontroller, we'll run through everything you would expect to find. Any computer system, the heart of it, you would expect to have a central processing unit. That's the arithmetic and logic unit that does, well, some simple operations. It moves things around. It can add numbers together. It might do division, and I stress might do, because there's a whole range of processes. The only mass they can do is plus. It certainly won't multiply, and it certainly won't divide. Even a Pentium processor needs a mass coprocessor to do multiplication and division. Basic central processors are very simple devices. They can add, they might do a bit of subtraction, if you're lucky. They can do some logic, certainly, because uh, that's what uh, computers are good at, and operations or exclusive ORs, etc. But that's about it. What else do we have in a computer? We would have the code, the program. The program is normally permanently burnt into a PROM, EEPROM in the device. We would have some RAM, data area, RAM area, perhaps I should say data. It's where we store our temporary variables. We would have a timer, and we'll talk more about timers later on. And the last thing you will have is I.O., input and output. And that lot, all of that, is normally embedded into a single chip. And there is a... Here we have the single chip. Any processor card... Buried somewhere will be the single chip, and in that you will have all of this. And to give you an idea of how complex it is, if you take the PIC processor, as you've seen, I've shown you the PIC processor controls our gas cooker, it does our motor control, number of motor control systems, I've shown you uh, doing the spin dryer, the washing machine, how much code space you get in a PIC. Well, if you're lucky, and they let you buy the big memory device, you will have half a K, yes, half a K maximum of code space. So never bound about your 20 gigabytes worth of memory you need for anything made by Microsoft, forget it. Half a K maximum. Some of the earlier devices only have a quarter K. How much data RAM do you get? If you are lucky, you will have 64, not K, 64 bytes maximum of memory but what you will have is lots of IO maybe 24 bits if you're lucky 24 bits is more than enough to control most systems like let's go back to one of our vehicle systems here's a vehicle system the processor here this particular processor this is the Motorola 68HC11 I'm going to discuss that in a bit more detail later because you will need to know a little bit about this for the coursework you have to do for me. What has this got in here? This has got 4K bytes of code. 4K. It's actually quite good on memory. There's 1K of RAM in here. And there are four... 32 I.O. pins. So of these 40 pins on the device around here, two of them are the crystal, a few of them are the uh, some control pins, but the bulk of these are digital I.O. Nice, powerful device. And all of these pins are memory mapped into the RAM space of the processor. So it's a very powerful device. It's quite expensive in microcontroller terms. It costs about three, four pounds. That's about $25. And that is deemed expensive. The PIC device, as I said, this will cost you about five or six Malay dollars maximum. In fact, you can get them cheaper than that in volume. Very, very low cost, but they are made in the millions. And one thing they always have is lots of I.O. directly memory mapped. So what we try and do is that a microcontroller, key to it, processor, simple processor normally, some code space, not much, but enough to do your job. Remember, you're not swapping in and out lots of uh, heavy graphics orientated, icon orientated tasks. It's a control application. You can get them embedded into these small bite bits of code very easily. 
You don't need much RAM, you don't need much data space. In any case, RAM volatile data is dangerous. Anything that can be read and written can be corrupted. So you want to keep the data space to a minimum. But what you do need, digital I.O. Get the information in, get the information out. And you do that with these memory mapped I.O. pins. And literally what you have, if you if you look at the memory map of a processor, in fact it's in the book. If you look at the book, if you turn to the back, you'll find the PIC processor. Probably not best to do it now, but you'll actually find the addresses. They give you the addresses of the I.O. devices. There's a description of each of the memory locations available. And if we look at the PIC processor map, you've got this in your book. Here we have, they call it the file address. This is the first 16 bytes of memory, and this is the role that each of them pay, play. Address zero is an address pointer. Here is our timer. We'll talk about timers later. Very important, an 8-bit timer. This is the program counter where we are on our program. Status, uh, carry zero status flags. Here's the ones I want you to see. Port A. Port A is at address 5. So if you load any number into memory location 5, as well as being in that RAM, it will also appear on the pins of the processor, bit for bit, byte for byte. So your program can control the digital I.O. directly by writing to location 5 and location 6. You will write to port A and port B. And if you want to read back anything that's stimulating the processor coming in, you read back from those memory locations, and that's how you will input information. So we have our I.O. devices, and we can normally get away with most of our applications by using the actual internal resources of the microcontroller itself. The problem arises is when we get some really complex systems, how do we expand out of our system? And what I want to do now is introduce you to some other devices, mechanisms to expand our computer system outside of the basic chip. Now, all our chips, as I said, always has RAM, bit of ROM, bit of digital I.O., a timer, and something that does some maths. But if we need to expand it, we need to add on to the bus, the processor bus, some external peripheral devices. And I'm going to introduce you to just two of these devices. One of them is a parallel I.O. device. It's called the 8255. It's actually a device that was originally developed by Intel. Of course, they, they do tend to dominate this market quite widely. Um, very, very widely used. And of course, you'll find lots of these in PCs, and it's used as the model. It's copied by so many other manufacturers. They've licensed this design. Now, how does it work? What it actually is, it's an extension to the memory of the processor. But again, it is a single chip that combines memory with digital I.O. If you actually look at the device, it's, it, it, the device itself is a 40-pin device. But from a software point of view, it has three addresses. There's a base address, which is determined by the chip select. That is the actual address that selects the device itself and switches it on, such as you know, the COM port of a, a PC. Its base address is, is 378 hex. So you would, know, you would ask the electronic designer, what is the base address of this 8255? Base address plus zero, that is the base address itself, accesses port A. Base plus one addresses port B. Base plus two addresses port C. And base address plus three accesses the command register that tells us what these particular ports are actually doing. Now, how does it work? Each of these ports, each port A, B, and C, 
it has eight bits. They're bytes, it's byte wide. So we have three ports. This device gives us 24 extra digital I.O. pins that we can uh, use on our system. How does it work? Let's draw our ports again. What I'm going to do, I'm going to split C in half. I'm going to call it C high and C low. Now, this is actually, and here's the command register. I'm just going to split it up into individual bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Port A can be either in or out. So you can program it. And there's an individual bit in the command register that tells us whether the whole of port A are either inputs or outputs. Similarly, port B is pro programmable to be in and out. So there's port B. C, the register is split into two groups of four. And you can have the C high or the C low can be split to be inputs or outputs. So what have we achieved with this device? We've got 24 programmable I.O. pins, which means they can be either inputs or outputs. It's a general purpose device. Why was it invented? Because if you can produce a programmable general purpose peripheral device, you can make them in the millions, they become very low cost, and then you and I, the programmers, we can configure these devices on our initialization to do what we want for our application. This is why these things have come into existence. There's many of them. The A255, the parallel I.O., is one of the simplest of them all. Uh, but all computer systems, all computer designers, if you look at the design of the, of the system, you don't have specific chips for your application. You always have a whole family of programmable devices which you configure for your specific application. That way you get the uh, uh, um, economies of scale of mass production of these devices, and then you just configure it to do what you want. Now, let's just run through the A255. Nice device, and it's uh, got 24 I.O. pins in groups of eight. Port A can be all in or all out. Port B can be all in or all out. And finally, port C, you can split into two little nibbles. What can we use it for? Well, let's look at a problem. This is a keyboard. It's quite an expensive keyboard because there's a lot of keys on it. I mean, the majority of keyboards are normally four uh, four by four or four by three keypads, but a full blown keyboard is quite a complex beast. How does it work? How do we interface keyboards, keypads, switches, user inputs from human beings into the controller? Well, we use our 8255s. So why don't we just dismember the keyboard and look a bit closely at what we have inside. Here we have the guts of this keyboard. We can just zoom in on any small bit of it and you can see what happens. And what we have is actually a mesh. Any area you look, you'll see that we have a single scan line there on which we have a number of the keys in each row all connected, going through plated through holes. And if I was to turn that over, we'll see we have vertical lines now connecting the keyboard. Because what we have with a basic keyboard structure is we have a mesh, a network, cross hatching. We have what are known as the scan lines. And sitting on the other side of the board are the sense lines. So here we have scanning and sense. Now, until you actually press the key, until you press the key, the act of pressing the key shorts out one of the scan lines to one of the sense lines. So only when we actually press down on a key will that short be made. 
So how can we use this now together with our 8255 in order to create a scanned keyboard program? Well, let's start with our programmable device. We we'll have port A and port B only. General purpose device, we're going to have a matrix that is only four by four, because I haven't got enough room on the paper. Now remember, these will not normally be shorted out until you press the key. If we define our port A to be an output, and we connect up four of the outputs to the vertical, this can be our scan line. If we define port B to be an input, these are the sense. This is exactly how it's done. In any, even in a, you know, an AT keyboard, a PC keyboard, all keyboards, telephone keypads, mobile phones, they're all done this way. Let's bring the sense lines now back into port B. So we've only used about half the capability of the device. So these were outputs. These are our inputs. Now, I'm going to simplify this. I'm not going to go through the, through the whole of the electronics of this. I'm just going to give you a simplification. Let's assume that normally these things are switched off naught. So when nothing is sensed, what we do is we scan each in turn. So if we output 1, 0, 0, 0 onto there, and then we sense what comes back, because nothing is depressed, we'll get back 0, 0, 0, 0. And that's true for whatever we scan. But let's assume we've now pressed this key here. So on our first scan, 1, 0, 0, 0, there's no shorting out at all. This line here is not connected to there, so that would read back 0. This one, there is a short between that scan and that sense, but there was a zero there, so that still reads back zero. There's no connection here, that's a zero, and that's a zero. So on our first scan down there, we get back zero, 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 zero. Now we change our scan pattern. If we put out a different scan pattern, the next scan line, we now output zero, one, zero, zero. Now what will happen with our system? We've output nothing on this one. Zero, one, zero, zero. Zero down to there. That sense line there, that will still be zero. But now we've got a one coming down our scan line. That will come back and be conducted along the sense line and we'll detect the one there. So we'd read back 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. If we now scan the third vertical one, cross these out, and now we go 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 down there, we're going to detect nothing along there. 0 down there, we detect 0 along there. 1 down there, but there's nothing pressed on that vertical line, so this would still detect a zero and so on. And similarly for the final one, 0, 0, 0, 1 would get back zero. It's a very simple concept. If we have this crosshatch matrix, if only one key is depressed, if we scan each horizontal row at a time, sense back what's happening on the vertical, only one bit will be set, and that uniquely identifies the key. So that is how we scan a keyboard. So let's just think about that again. Here's our keyboard. There's our quite complex keyboard now. Internally, in fact, what we have are these horizontal and vertical lines. And only when the key is depressed, here if we zoom in on here, we we'll see one of these pads, we we'll see the interface between 
Here we have the vertical line coming in here. There's the little shorting pad, and there's the hole that drops through to the vertical line on the other side. And so when the key is depressed, it shorts out these tracks, and we get our single key depression on that pad. And that pad directly lines up with one of these keys. Where I mean, underneath the key is a shorting pad that will short out the horizontal, short out the horizontal to the vertical line that's sitting on the other side of the keyboard. So here we have a very simple scanned matrix approach to a keyboard. As long as you only press one key, then you can uniquely detect what it is by scanning and then sensing it back. And we've done that with a programmable 8255 device. But it's not the whole story. It never is, is it? These are mechanical devices. Let's look at a switch. I've got here deliberately... Uh, I, I've made this worse than it would normally be, but here we have a very crude, simple switch. Now, here we have the switch can be either in this state or in that state, on or off. Think of this as our keypad on a very large scale. So we push it down and then we release push it down and then we release and as you can see and also hopefully here when it makes a contact it bounces literally bounces off of the contact rather than being a very clean change from a logic one to a logic zero there's a period of uncertainty while the switch bounces around now it doesn't matter what the quality of your switch is, all mechanical components exhibit bounce. It's basic law of mechanics. If you move any object into another, it will bounce. Whatever you do, it will happen. It may be very fast, but it always happens. So when we take a key and we press the key, no matter how gentle we press it, there will always be a momentary bounce off the contact because the energy has to go somewhere. And all switches, all switches will bounce. So the signal that we will get back from our contact closure, instead of being a nice clean state from on to off, in fact, you get a period of uncertainty while the switch bounces around, and then finally it settles down. And this is known as the bounce period. The bounce period. It's your job to sort it out. You're the programmer. And that's why all programs that monitor mechanically generated input signals, you must go through the process of debouncing the input signal. Debouncing is essential to remove this effect from the monitoring of an input signal. Now, even if that signal is electronic, so you might think, oh, well, you know, a nice computer-generated electronic signal is probably not going to have a mechanical component in it. You don't know that. You don't know what generated it. You don't know that that electronic signal was not generated further down the system by some other mechanical component, and you don't know whether the electronics that read that mechanical component was properly debounced. You must always treat any digital input with grave suspicion, and you must always debounce all digital input signals. Now, what is the process of debouncing? Well, it's very simple. You don't just look for a change of state. You have to look for a change of state and a period of stability. And that stability time has to be greater than the bounce time of that mechanical component. So in our example here, where we're trying to debounce our switch, we have to monitor it for a period of time that is greater than the known bounce period and only if we've seen it stable 
for the whole of that time period, the debounce time, it's called the debounce time, then do we know its change state. And you must do this for all inputs. Now, I'll give you an example. Typically, if it's mechanical, you have to allow anything up to 100 milliseconds for a mechanical signal to be debounced. For an electronic one, I would still debounce for 10 milliseconds, maybe more. You might have to experiment to be sure you know what it is, but you must debounce the signal. So, our computer program for our keyboard now is rather more complicated, isn't it? Because as well as having our 8255 scanning and sensing, and as long as only one key is depressed, in our word we we'll get back, one bit only will be set. That's not good enough. You mustn't just say, that now means that key is depressed. You have to continually monitor at regular intervals. I mean, you want to monitor as quickly as you can, but at least 10 times in the bounce period. And every one of those readings, those returned values from the keyboard scan routine, must be identical. Only when they're all identical for the whole of the debounce period can you finally say for sure the key has settled down and here is the signal. So, let's now finish off our job. Port A, Port B, Port C, Control. We program up Port B, A to be an output and that provides the scan line. We program up Port B to be an input. Those are our sense lines, and now we can run a program that continually scans and senses. Only one bit must be set. If more than one bit is set, it means that we press more than one key and we have an ambiguous situation. You don't actually really know what's going to happen. If you were to press that key and that key, uh, you might be able to decipher it. But if you press two, three keys down, you're in trouble. So you're better off. Uh, uh, ensuring only a single key depression occurs that ensures that you have a totally unambiguous result and you must debounce that result for I would say at least 100 milliseconds that is take 10 samples at 10 millisecond intervals make sure all 10 are the same do it as a moving window keep on have a have a stack where you drop off the oldest value and drop in the new one and when you see 10 consecutive readings the same that's it the key has changed state you have debounced the signal so that is how we would do a keyboard scan routine how many keys can we do think about our scan system We've got port A, 8, port B, 8, come back. So what is the total number of keys we can have on this keyboard? It can only be 8 by 8, which is what? 64 keys maximum. Now you go to this keyboard. There's substantially more than 64 keys here. Not only do you have all the alphabetical keys, the numerics, the diacriticals, function keys, the, the, the keypad here, you've got this ability to have shift, caps lock, control operations. There's usually far, far more than that. So how do we extend the keyboard using the 8255? Well, you don't do it by scanning. This program, 8x8, and debouncing is already complicated enough. It's actually done by using port C as an input port and if we take directly into the input port the control key, the shift key, the out key for the alternative keyboard on an AT keyboard, you can use these digital inputs to extend the meaning of the keyboard. So we scan a basic 64 keys, but by combination of these extra inputs, you can, uh, in, I've shown four here, you can have 16 additional uh, key sets available. You can expand the keyboard by using half of port C, 
purely as an input port to give you your additional functionality. So there we have, in short, 8255's programmable I.O. The I.O. can be input or output. It's done to give you economies of scale so you can mass produce these devices in the millions, very, very low cost. We, the programmers, we then configure them to do the job we want. One example, using a keyboard. Scanned matrix, scan and sense lines. But we must take account of the problem of debounce. We have the problem of our switches will bounce around up and down. So we must have the debounce period. We must look for a constant signal for a period of time. And only when we know it's change state and remain change state do we know we actually have the value we want. What about timing? Well, let's introduce to you another rather useful device. The A253 is almost the industry standard general purpose programmable timer. And it has a very similar structure to the 8255. In fact, it's the same core processor really, it's just slightly different functionality. There's a base address and it consists of 16 bit timers, three independent 16 bit timers. Timer A, B, C and a control register. This is an address base plus zero, that's plus one, that's plus two, and that is plus three. So we can have three independent timers. One is at base zero, base one, base two, and at base three is a control register that tells us how these things operate. Now for a timer to work, it needs some clock source. It needs some sort of clock system. So for each of these devices, there is a clock input and it's up to the electronic designer to put in the uh, correct signal to the timer so that we have our reference. And all of these devices have an independent output and we can define what we want that output to do. So let's just have a summary of the basic device. Basic device, a 16-bit timer. Now all the timer is is just a register that counts up. Every time you pulse in, 0 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4. If it's 16 bits, when it reaches its terminal count, FFFF, it will wrap around and go back to zero because computers are stupid. When they reach a number they can't think of anymore, they go back to zero. If you've got an 8-bit register, 0 goes to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4. When it reaches 255, you add 1 to 255. What do you get? Well, we've got brains. We know that means 256 for the computer. It just goes back to zero. It wraps around. That's all the timer counter does. It's just a long register. You clock in and it just counts the pulses coming in. The output is used to tell us it's reached its terminal count. Now in the case of an 8253, they're a bit unusual in that instead of counting up, they count down. So for example, if you wanted to count 20, you would load it with 20. Remember these registers are all in the memory map. You just write to them with your program. They're in the, they're, these devices, programmable devices, are located somewhere in the memory map of your program. So all you have to do, if you want to count 20 clock pulses, you write 20 into the register, time array, and then you keep monitoring it, and every time a clock pulse comes in, it will decrement, and when it reaches zero, then you can detect that by reading the register, and you've timed a period. There's more interesting things you can do, though. We have a clock input and an output device. You can instruct this register to operate in one of two ways. You could either have it wrap around. That means that if you go from 4 to 3 to 2 to 1 
to zero. When you reach the terminal count of zero, it wraps back round to hex FFFF and starts counting down from there. So it wraps around. That's one way that you can have it operating. Permanently just counting down, wrapping round and round and round, counting the full range of the system, of the numeric range. So you've got from FFFF, and it will count down again to 3, 2, 1, 0, and then it will wrap around back to FFFF. That's one way that you can drive the counter. The other way you can drive it is by having it automatically reload a new starting point. So let's assume you want your reload value to be, say, 56. You would program it using the control register. Say, I am now going into auto reload mode. And what that means is it will count down 56, 55, 3, 2, 1, and at 0, it will reload back at number 56. That's auto reload. So our counter, its numeric range can either be the whole lot, wrap around, FFFF all the way down to zero, and then wrap around and start again the whole circuit, or we can auto reload any number we like. So we can preset it to say only count eight, it goes eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, and back to eight. Auto reload mechanism. Two ways to use the input. Take a note of that. There's also various things we can do with the output. Now the output will only do something on the terminal count. So when we go from one to zero, that is the terminal count. We've reached the end of the count. We can do one of two things with the output. We can either have it produce what's known as a single shot. That is, when we reach zero, it outputs a little blip, and that's it, and goes away. Or, we can have it toggle. That means it changes state from a naught to a one, or, if it was already a one, it would go from a one to a zero. These are the two possible modes. There are many more, of course, because there's uh, eight bits in the control register, but I'm only giving you a few examples. So for the output op options, we can have either a single shot or we can make it toggle. Now this just gives us an idea of various things we can do. How can we use this device usefully? Well, one thing that's very, very common is to generate, having to generate a bode rate for a synchronous or an asynchronous conflict. How do we generate a fixed frequency output? Well, if we set our system to be auto reload plus toggle and we make the auto reload to be half the bode rate so let's assume we have a one kilohertz clock coming in and we want a bode rate of say um, one bit every uh, 100 hertz. No, can we do that? If we set the divider to be a divide by 2, so that will go 2 to 1 to 0, and we're setting it to topple, then the output frequency here will be 1 kilohertz divided by our auto reload, so we will get a 500 hertz bode rate coming out. So we set up a bode rate, a fixed frequency by doing an auto reload, automatically reload a number, we have a frequency coming in, F, we auto reload a number N, whatever it is, and that means the output frequency will be F divided by N, because here is the divider for that input frequency, and if we make it toggle, Every time it counts down, it will change state, and that will give us a fixed frequency output that we can use for our bode rate generator. One way to use the device. Now, another way we could use it, think of a typical problem you'd have in a process. How would you bake a cake? 
the way you bake a cake is you get the ingredients, you mix it all up, you put it in a, in a pan, you put it in the oven and you bake it for say 20 minutes. Well you don't want your computer just sitting there waiting for 20 minutes while the cake is cooked. You want it to go off and do something else. So what we need is some mechanism to give us a signal to say, hey, do you remember that cake you put in the oven? Now's the time to take it out. This is a very common process in real-time systems, is to set up delays and waits while we wait for something to happen. But we don't want to waste the process of time. We go off and do something else. What we want is for when that process, when it's finished, to interrupt us and say, oh, you remember me? You set me off a little while ago, and now you need to service me turn off the, the gas to the cooker, or whatever the process is. We can use an 8253 to do that. If we use it in wraparound mode, because we don't want the thing to be changing state too quickly, and we preload it with a number N, and we set it to be a single shot, let's assume we have a one kilohertz input there. That means we're going to get a pulse every microsecond, milli, sorry, millisecond. If we want to have our cake cook for one second, if we set N to equal 1000, we load in 1000, and then we set it to single shot, when that reaches zero, we'll get a little pulse out one second later. And if we connect that to an interrupt on our processor, that will give us a warning that this is timed out and now we need to service this particular system. We'll talk a lot more about interrupts later on. So we can use the 8253 to set up an interval to say, right, we'll load a number in it now, and then we'll forget about it. It will count down it independently of the processor, so we don't need to use a program loop to worry about timing. When the 8253 times out, it goes blip blip. Out comes an interrupt signal on a single shot. It goes to an interrupt pin on the processor that freezes what the processor is doing at that moment of time and calls an interrupt service routine that switches off the oven or whatever the process is going to be. You can also use 8253s to measure frequencies, to measure periods, because they, if you just left it to free run, let's assume we put in a, a timer, we set it to uh, wrap around, and because it's memory map, that means at any time you like, you can read the contents of that timer, and you know what the time of day is. Now that's exactly what a PC does. The PC, it's 8253, if you want to write this down, you'll find a hex address OX34. I've got the code somewhere. In fact, you've got the code because you've all been given a, a disk, lots of my programs on, and you'll find in there, embedded in one of the programs, I think it's the uh, Skin DSR program, the actual code to access the timer chip of a PC. And I use that for, for doing programmable control. You can read that time anytime you like, and that allows you to measure periods, intervals, frequencies. If you want to be really clever, you can actually crank that timer up. It runs very slowly on a PC, but you can crank it up to at least 5 kilohertz, and you can actually use a PC to do real-time control and instrumentation by in increasing the clock speed by a factor of about a couple hundred. It wreaks havoc with Windows programs. It doesn't like it at all. But do it under DOS, and you can use a standard PC to do real-time control and instrumentation to very high precision. So. What I've introduced to you now are two mechanisms to extend the operations of a microcontroller. All microcontrollers have as standard processor, code space, data space, and some digital I.O. and at least one internal timer. If you need to expand that system, you need to use a programmable, programmable interface device, such as the 8255, which gives you more I.O., or the 8253, that gives you timing operations. The 8255 gives you three 
8-bit registers, each of which can be made to be an input or an output. And I've discussed with you how you use that to scan a keyboard using scan lines and sense lines and the importance of debouncing the signal, any input signal, over a period of time. With the 8253, this is a tool that um, allows you to add and extend the timing capability of your system three 16-bit timers. You need a clock source. You can program the thing up to either wrap around or to auto-reload. You can make the output of the timer either change state on terminal count or give you a single shot. Those combinations allow you to generate a variety of functions, bode rate generators, frequency outputs, frequency measurements, period measurements, timed intervals so you can sequence through a sequence of functions. These two tools, bus-based devices, they sit on the processor bus and they will extend your system capability. Welcome back. This is going to be the final discussion on output devices, and this is going to be devoted only to how we handle timing using a Motorola processor. And the reason why this is important is that you will need to have this knowledge in order to complete the coursework. Now we're going to do most of this on the board. Timing is a key component in all systems, all microcontrollers. So let's consider how do we do timing. Well, firstly, there must be a basic timing reference, and that in all computers is the crystal. That's the key to everything. So when you buy a processor, you buy you know 300 meg uh, Pentium or a 20 meg. Uh, 8051 or a 4 meg PIC processor, it's the crystal that determines the key timing element of the system. That's a quartz cut crystal normally, very precise, very accurate. Now that will be running too fast for our use. So all processors divide it down by a fixed prescaler. They vary by how much they do it. The 8051 microprocessor divides by 12. The Motorola HC11, interestingly enough, only divides it by 2, which means you can actually run the processor at a lower clock speed. That's actually useful. It uses less power. A PIC processor divides it by 4. You don't need to remember this. You just need to be aware of the concept that you have the basic crystal well, that could be 20 megahertz, maybe 1 megahertz, maybe less, but there'd be a basic crystal. You, you don't get into, into uh, anything enormous with these devices. You get the 300 megahertz on Pentiums. You don't get that on uh, real-time systems. 20 megahertz is about the fastest you want to bother about. And there is always a fixed prescaler. And out of this, you will get the basic system timer clock. That is a constant. You could set that up. You'll look it up. You will know what the processor divides down by. You will know what crystal is fitted. Do you know what your basic timing reference always is? It's a constant. Now what do we do with that? There will be another register in the system called the clock prescaler. That will be memory mapped, and you, the programmer, can put any number you like into it. And what that does is it gives us an output reference that is clock divided by that number you preset. Clock divided by n in the prescaler register. That's up to you to do it. So how do we get our basic timing reference? The crystal. 
the crystal attached to the basic processor. It's always divided down by a constant to give us our basic system or machine clock internally. And that, you know what it is. Now for the coursework, I'm more than happy for you just to assume what that value there is. Don't worry about anything above that. That's down to the electronic engineer. But you need to tell me what your basic system clock is going to be. That is divided down by a free scalar. That's programmable. You write that number. Whatever that number is, you write in N. That will give us a basic timing reference of clock divided by N. So, for example, if this was 1 megahertz and we were using a PIC processor, what we would get out of there is 250 kilohertz at that point, because we divide down by 4. If we wanted our timing reference to be only 1 millisecond, we need a kilohertz timing reference. So if we set N to be 250, the output here would be 250 kilohertz divided by 250 equals 1 kilohertz. Now that is a sensible time constant to use for timing uh, problems within a real-time system. So, let's run through that lot again. System timing. Crystal. There's some fixed divider which is determined by the processor that won't change and you just look it up in the book. Out of that, we will get the basic uh, machine clock, the system clock, whatever you care to call it, and then you intervene by putting in a pre-scalar, n, any number you like. These registers are usually 8 bits wide. They might be 16 in some more complex processors. They're usually, though, only 8 bits wide. So using the pre-scalar, as long as you know what the clock is, you can divide by any number you like, and you will get out of here clock divided by N. And we use that as the basis, the core of our timing and our counting and our scheduling in our real-time system. Clock divided by N, where you determine the pre-scalar. Now, how do we then use this? We've got our timing mechanism. All microcontrollers have a register known as the free running counter. They've all got them. The 8051 from Intel has it and all its derivatives. The Motorola 6811 has it. The PIC processor has it. All processors have it. Pentiums don't, but they're not real-time systems. They're batch processors. Real-time processors must have a timing register that's accessible under program control for you to do real-time work. Its full name is the free running counter free running counter, because all it is, it's a 16-bit counter that just counts up from 000 to FFFF and then wraps around the game. And what rate does it do it? It does it at the clock rate that you have generated yourself. So if you have generated a 1 kilohertz signal there, how long does that take to overflow? Well, it's 1 kilohertz divided by 65,536. That's approximately, what, 60 seconds it would take to overflow. You can set it up to any time period you like. Because the FRC is memory mapped, All that happens is every time a clock pulse comes in, it's decremented. But you can read that or write that anytime you like in your program. 
So that means it's a very powerful timing tool. Now the way I normally do it, I normally write my programs in C, it's my preferred language. I would normally have a pointer to the, to the FRC, I would call that star FRC, I would make that point to the free running counter, and that means any access to that pointer gives me the current time with respect to that time constant, so I can use that for timing operations. So here we have a mechanism to set up your own internal timing reference at any time you like and to read it and write from it whenever you wish. Now I want to extend this concept a little bit more because sometimes it's necessary for you to capture an event, a rising edge event coming into the processor. Now what could that be? That could be a switch closing, or uh, an 8255 at F53 externally timing out, or a pressure switch that's reached to pressure, whatever there's a signal. It could be somebody driving along, they press the breath foot on their brake, you want to stop the car. You, one thing that is very common is you need to monitor external events. It could be a frequency. Do you remember the little turbine wheel in my shower? If I want to know the speed it's going at, in order to measure the frequency, I need to know the time of that edge, the time of that edge, and then the inverse of the difference between the two times, that is a measure of the frequency. So how can we use this mechanism to capture frequencies? Well, I'll simplify the drawing. Let us assume we've already generated our system clock. And this goes into our free running counter. So we have here a number that is directly related to that clock, so we can read the time of day at any time. An extremely valuable facility, essential actually for real time systems, extremely valuable facility that's absolutely essential is a concept known as input capture. Now what input capture does is that it ties one of the input pins on the processor to the free running counter. And what happens is, is that when it detects the rising edge an instantaneous copy of that is captured into the input capture register. And the great thing about it is that that memory maps as well. So what happens is, is that independent of your program, you don't have to worry about it, this is done in the electronics. The actual real time that that event occurred is captured into the input capture because it takes a snapshot of the current time is copied into there, which means sometime later, no programs work instantly. You, if you were to just to poll that pin, you'd always be a bit too late. But by using the input capture idea, and that also is memory mapped, it means that at any time you like, you can now read the contents of the input capture uh, uh, register, and that will tell you the time that that rising edge event occurred, and you can put that into your program. Now, if you capture one edge and then capture another edge, you can calculate the frequency. So the input capture register is a means of capturing a snapshot of the free running counter so that you can timestamp the occurrence of a rising edge on the input capture pin of the processor. All decent processors, the PIC doesn't do this, but the Motorola 8051 and the HC11 and similar uh, devices of that genre, usually ones costing two, three, four pound, they will all have an input capture facility, which means that independent of your program, a snapshot of the time can be taken when a, a signal coming in goes from a naught to a logic level one. So you can use that for frequency and period measurement. What about output capture? Another interesting concept.
how can we preset events to happen in the future? Well, we can do that with the output capture register. The way that works is, is that whenever the output capture register equals the free running counter, that issues an interrupt to the processor and it calls an interrupt service routine where you can write your own program. So what you can do if you want to have a signal, say in 100 millisecond time, read the contents of the FRC, add 100 to it and write it into the output capture register. Then go away and do what you want. In the meantime, this will be creeping up. So you start with FRC and you load into here FRC plus interval, whatever that interval is. And when you finally reach that, and so the FRC equals the output capture register, an interrupt is issued, halting your process and saying, hey, we've, that time's passed, what did you want to do? And then you can pass control of your program to your interrupt service routine. So here we have a little bit more complex timing operations. Run through it again. All processors have a crystal. That is divided down by a preset value to give you the basic system clock. You then divide it down by preloading the free scalar register to give you the system clock frequency that you want to use for your application. That number is fed into that crystal frequency is fed into the free running counter. That's a 16-bit register, memory map, so you can read it at any time. So you can read the current time of day whenever you wish under program control. Now, in order to time input events, you can use the input capture register. What happens is, and that's another 16-bit register that is tied to one of the input pins of the processor. And when we see a rising edge event on that, a snapshot of the time, it's like a little alarm clock really, a snapshot of the time is copied from the FRC into the input capture register and remains fixed. Now you and your program sometime later, once you've realised that's happened, you can go and examine the contents of the input capture register and that will tell you the exact time that that event occurred. Extremely useful for measuring input frequencies. Output capture is a way of presetting a programmable interval. What happens is, is that when the FRC equals the contents of the output capture register, it issues an interrupt to your process and you call an interrupt service routine. What you can do then to pre-program an interval is load into the OCR the current value of the free running counter plus a fixed interval and then go away and when eventually that times up and matches that value it halts your process calls an interrupt service routine and you can process the output do whatever you want to do in this case you could be using it to generate an output frequency signal so here we have the use of the timer within a processor